Welcome into the Inside Bassmaster Podcast, episode 91 here. Ronnie Moore, your host as normal, and my co-host, as always, Kyle Jesse, the digital content editor of Bassmaster.com. You can find Kyle. I mean, he's cooking up something, whether he's on site at a lead event taking photos or he's producing content from other tournaments, but he is a man on a mission and his expense reports say so. Kyle, we just wrapped up the 2022 Bassmaster Elite Series season and uh, we did so back to back Lake Oahe. We talked about that in the last episode of the podcast a little bit. We'll touch more on it in future episodes with Austin Felix as a guest. And then we just wrapped up our season in La Crosse, Wisconsin at the Mississippi River. Brian Schmidt getting that knocked out. What's your first thoughts from going to lacrosse for the first time and seeing the Mississippi River? It's one that we talked about. It's the most visual, uh, visually appealing places and the, what you get to experience strategy-wise and the blow-ups that you see. It's unparalleled and how tight the weights can be in the standings. Yeah, absolutely. It's a place that I have looked forward to going to for many, many, many years. Bassmaster Elite Series tournaments that happened years and years ago, you know, made me want to go fish that place because of the fact that every way you can catch them is a super fun way to catch them. I mean, you're talking about obviously the top water stuff, the flipping, the finding groups of fish and catch them basically every cast. I mean, there's so much that that body of water has to offer. And then coming into the tournament, obviously we had so many storylines and I know you and I talked about it. It's, it's hard to imagine a body of water that would be more ideal to have the last term of the season on because you know, you're never safe. I mean, you're just not safe. We saw that with Brandon Polnick with the AOY, um, you know, had a good first day and it looked like, you know what, I think he's probably going to do it. And then, you know, day two struggled and in the Bass Track, you, you saw that on Bass Track. Um, and it seemed like it was slipping out of his hands, but being able to fluctuate so much with the weights, move up and down the leaderboard. Um, and then Chris Johnson added, almost had a, Chris Johnson had a two pound lead on Brian Schmidt, who was third place. Right, and he came right. come back on the final day and win. That's a huge lead at the Mississippi River. Absolutely. And, and, you know, everything that you had going into that tournament and then add into the fact that it was just a very visually appealing tournament, like you mentioned, um, definitely made for a fun one. And it was it was every bit of what I was hoping for. Um, and I'm still still now wanting to go fish it because I, I love watching tournaments there, seeing it, being a part of it. City of Lacrosse is a really cool place. Uh, obviously, the first time I've ever been there, too. So overall, just an extremely fun event. Awesome. Well, if you're listening to the podcast today, we're going to get into a little bit more of the intricacies of the AOI race, the classic cut line, the, you know, everything Mississippi River related, because there was a couple guys who had to get it done this week to make their classic dreams come true. Some still have some work to do in the opens, but we will also be covering in this episode just a few minutes from now, we will be talking about the 2023 Bassmaster Elite Series schedule that was just announced on Wednesday after the tournament. So two days after the season ended. You got your wish. You don't know what to talk about in the offseason. We're going to hand you a nine-event Elite Series schedule, and we'll get into that and more, Kyle. But as we turn our focus back to the Mississippi River, what a great event we had there. Yeah, it was It was honestly almost frustrating because you know exactly what I mean when I say this. It's like if you are trying to shoot a gallery and you have like a billion fish catches, it's hard to have any variance in the, in the gallery. I mean, it's just nothing but – Keith Combs or Brandon Lester or whoever it may be just reeling a fish on every single cast because there's nothing in between that happens that you can kind of illustrate and show what's going on so it's frustrating as far as that goes but it's super thrilling because I mean I'd say every day um, between day one to all the way to championship Monday I covered somebody that caught him every cast for probably 10 casts in a row um, which is hard to do that's a lot I mean that's really difficult oh, to yeah. do but somebody every single day of coverage did that. I think Zaldane did it on day one, um, day two. I can't even remember who I really covered, to be honest. Uh, but I know Keith Combs did it too, day three and day four, um, especially to start day four. I'm sure, obviously, you guys saw that on live and everything. But it was just wild. It was insane to see how many fish were caught. Um, you know, you and I talked about it a little bit on the last podcast. It's such a visually appealing tournament oh, yeah. because naturally all the frog fishing and the blow up. Um, uh, blow ups and everything. I mean, it's pretty awesome. So, um, you know, my general takeaways that was probably my favorite tournament of the year. Um, first time I've ever actually been to lacrosse as well, um, which I'm a huge fan of now. I'd never knew that I would like that city as much as I do, but uh, it's all really cool and great place to end the season. That's for sure. That's what's interesting because it was the lowest winning weight event we had all season long, and it was beloved by all of the fishing fans. It's incredible. It's incredible how many people love this event. But rightfully so. I mean, this is the fifth time we've been there. And we've seen so many awesome things. Like you said, uh, talking about how many fish these people catch, 
whenever somebody says, Hey man, how'd you do today? And you're like, I caught a hundred bass. You're like, that's a bunch of crap. Do you really realize how many bass, 100 bass? That's a lot. You know, if you fish for eight hours, you're catching, what's the quick math there, Kyle, you're catching 12 fish an hour. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's one fish up. That's one fish every five minutes. That's a lot of fish in a day. If you're going to catch a hundred fish in an eight hour day, look at that math. I mean, that's, I guess that's why I'm a stat guy, but literally it's so many fish. And when you go to the Mississippi river in lacrosse, you actually do catch 50, 50, 60 fish in a day. And so I know the, the photo galleries back in the day would be like, I've spent day three with Brandon Lester and here he is catching his first fish at 8 a.m. And then you're just a bunch of photos and it's like two hours later, he still has caught fit. Yeah. And it's like, you just continue to watch that. So what a great event to end the year. And Brian Schmidt, I mean, normally we know, or I have a really good gut feeling on who won. I'll just say when, when live is done, we sit in studio and we shoot recap videos, little quick wrap ups about who won the event and a couple highlights of their thing. And then, and then we were done. And we save that for after weigh-in and whoever wins, we, we post that. Well, we shot the Chris Johnston one. I looked at Tommy and Zona and said, let's shoot a Brian Schmidt one just in case. If we all go home, I don't want him to win. And then all of a sudden we don't have a video of him. So I was like, let's just shoot Brian Schmidt's video just in case. And then he wins and he was just as shocked on stage. I mean, he literally like, he looked over at him and it said, you need 14 11 to win and he's like oh he's got that and it was 14 6 and he's just like no way dude absolutely crazy so to see the drama at the scales as well not only just back and forth on the water but to see it happen on the scales was cool i also i wanted to talk to you about uh who did you cover the couple days i know you mentioned keith Combs, brandon lester but kind of tell me your progression and where you were on this body of water because there was three pools you could go spend time in pool eight i've never been to pool seven or pool nine when i've been there but you can go to all these different pools and it's like a whole different world another different lake that you're on for that given body of water i'm i'm drawing a complete blank as to who i covered on day two because i can remember every other day besides day two I know day two, I ended up going back to Lester, but day one started with Lester, obviously with the AOY story. Um, he stayed there close to takeoff and pool eight, uh, fished there for a good while, fished around some different areas. Uh, and then by the time we left him, I can't remember who we covered, uh, Chris Saldane in Stoddard area of pool eight, um, obviously the south end of that pool. Um, day Did you two start on Lester? Day. Did you start on Lester on day two, you said? No, no, we had day two. I went. I went to Lester. We had um, who do we uh, have on camp? Mosley, Lester, Polinick, Johnston, Shakurit, Benton, New, Schmidt, Heron, and Gussie. Benton covered Drew Benton uh, there at the Onalaska Spillway on day two. Then transitioned to Lester, who was fishing by the dam when I covered him. Obviously, catch him on a top water. Uh, that was no fun at all to watch. I mean, that was just not fun. Um, <laughs> completely sarcastic. But uh, then on day three and four, covered uh, Keith Combs both days. And, and that was the most interesting thing I saw, obviously, during the tournament was day three. Obviously, Keith Combs started his day in pool, um, pool nine, obviously made the run down there with Gerald Swindle. Um, and then they both had to come up at, you know, I'd say 1130, somewhere around that time frame. Uh, and then at the end of that day, which I don't know if you guys saw it on live because I didn't see it in person either, but he hits a spot in pool eight after he locks back up, catches, er, calls out his entire weight, entire, you know, his entire day, calls it out um, on one spot. So on the final day, he started on that spot and then reversed the, the you know, the rotation, of course, which was, I know, a big story, but when I'm on the water, obviously, I don't get to see live and see the, you know, all the things you guys are saying, but um that was really interesting. And then once that bite kind of died, and when I say died, I mean, it, it died because he caught him, like I said, just basically every cast for a good portion of time um, and then bounced and went down and, you know, obviously had some, I wouldn't say troubles necessarily, but some timing issues, of course, with the lock and things of that nature. So um, he, it was a really impressive tournament to see him bounce back. I think there was definitely some people, you know, looking for him to win that event just to make it into the classic, just for the sake of, we call it, we almost called it. We almost called yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it, you know, he, he made, he had a really good tournament and, uh, you know, we were talking about it this morning in our digital meeting. It'll be interesting to see him fish the last couple of central opens, um, including, um, you know, Rayburn. Sam Rayburn. I mean, that's, uh, 
there's a lot of potential for him to still make the classic yet. So um, that'll be an interesting storyline to take care of. But, but yeah, I got to see pool eight and nine, I guess is the long way around to answer your question. Well, and that's the interesting thing is that pool, that, that strategy that Combs had. And uh, like I said, it was a tough deal because I said that it swindle and Combs probably can't win this event because they lost a couple hours of their day on day three. It wasn't like they had trouble, whatever. They just had to leave their areas so early. It was going to be difficult. But Combs ended up finding that spot, doing well. So he had something confidently that he could fish pool not pool eight with before going down. Whereas Swindle, I feel like it was all eggs in the pool nine basket. And the problem on the final day, there was a lot, there was a barge in the lock at takeoff. So even though it's 20 minutes away, it's still a process. And so Combs knew that went to his area in pool eight, caught him, got, got a good start, was able to check on it. And they're like, we got another barge that was coming through pool seven to pool eight. So he knew that he needed to get down in there, fish for an hour and come back. And him and Swindle both were able to make it back. And kudos to the, to the lock and dam folks. Um, because it's, I heard nothing but good things on the phone, talking to those guys each evening saying how that they were they were the the lady and the two guys that were doing uh the lock and dam those days were just super upfront about it they got us in quick and it wasn't a big process it's 15 minutes for them to get in shut the doors go up and go down or whatever and then open the doors and leave so they were able to do it very quickly and and avoid necessarily like losing a bunch of time but just knowing the, that's the biggest thing you're okay with leaving at 11 if you knew you're gonna have to leave at 11 but like seeing a barge on a tracker that wasn't there and then having to show up and the lock master doesn't want to let you through. That's a hard thing to handle. So knowing your strategy and knowing what time you're going to have to fish when you are locking is super important. So awesome event. Like we mentioned, uh, I feel for Chris Johnston second event in a row, he's gotten second place, uh, but not being outside the top 20 since the Santee Cooper event like, so Chickamauga, he got 20th, and every event after that, he was in the top 20. So event number four through nine, what an incredible stretch for him to jump up and to finish the, the year third in Angler of the Year. But Chris Johnston, to lose by like a pound and a half or two pounds or whatever it was to Austin Felix, and then turn around and lose by five ounces or four ounces to Brian Schmidt, you got to feel for Chris Johnston. And, uh, man, I'm starting to wonder when the Johnstons are going to win their next one because – Corey won the open last fall, but then he's gotten second at the elite. Chris has had a couple close calls in the top 10 this year. And it's just it's something seems like it's just, it just didn't connect on that final day for him. And I'm not going to say that they, you know, choked it all because that's not the case. They caught him. It's just weird circumstances that they just end up not getting the victory. So what a great uh, way to wrap up the season for Chris Johnson. He he made himself a whole bunch of money the last three events to get back up into the top five in AOI race. So kudos to that. But any thoughts about that whole situation of watching Bass Track and seeing Schmidt and Johnston and Combs and Lester all going back and forth in the final two hours of the day? Uh, it was pretty incredible to see. And, you know, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but at weigh-in was really a, uh, a weird time because when Schmidt weighed in, it went from like, you know, Chris Johnston probably has this to, I don't know if he does. Like you and I were texting about doing a uh, tackle tip after the tournament. And you said, Hey, if, if Johnston wins, you know, do this or this and this, you know, to get the tackle tip done. And I said, what if Johnston doesn't win? Because it seemed like at that time, the momentum had shifted a little bit. It was like, he's going to have to have more. And, you know, I just happened to be standing right next to his boat when he was talking to some people and he, he genuinely made it seem like he really didn't think he had enough. And it wasn't like, lying talk I mean you can kind of get the sense if somebody's just pulling your leg or not I mean he genuinely you could tell was bummed because he didn't think he had enough and sure enough he didn't so um it was definitely a wild way to finish the season um, I'm sure we're going to get into this at some point but you know the thing that's the most incredible to me about this tournament is that even though Polinick slipped at Oahe and didn't make the cut didn't have a great event um, you know, kind of left the door wide open. We wanted to say, even though I don't feel like anybody really felt that way completely. Um, the fact that that Lester and Chris Johnston did exactly what they needed to do to make it a close race. I mean, like you almost never see that. I mean, like one of the two, you know, or three that have a chance normally will just not have a good tournament. It's like, they don't even have a chance. And we've seen that over the course of history happen a decent bit is like, you know, the guy that's chased him doesn't do himself any favors. 
I mean, it'd be hard to do much better than those two did with the opportunity they were given, um, you know, which really challenged Polnick. And you could tell that when he got up on stage and won the award, I mean, that meant a lot to him because like, it just like, he, I don't know his exact words, but basically gave him like a rush, like, you know, to, to know that this is not mine yet. Like I'm still in the battle for this, like a hundred percent. So uh, to me, that was the most interesting thing to watch in the tournament. It's like, you could almost hardly believe that the two guys that were chasing him did everything in their, you know, power basically to make it uh, difficult for Brandon. So that was, that was probably the most interesting part of the tournament for me. Yeah. We, we tried to do the best that we could on Bassmaster live to showcase not only the Mississippi river event, but also the angler of the year race, which was the big story that comes down to. And normally we haven't had a close AOI race that has not featured an AOI championship event, which, which is where we can just stick the cameras on the AOI contenders and watch it. We're trying to stick them on the AOI contenders, also have a show going on about the tournament, and then ended up helping that two of our three guys who you know, ended up making the top 10 were in the AOI race. But it was weird when Polinick made the day three cut to say that the leader of the event was eliminated from the AOI conversation. And we, I know we talked on the phone about it, but because of the point differential and the tiebreakers, it was like Brandon Polinick making the final or making the day three cut eliminated Chris Johnston because Chris couldn't gain anymore. And once he made the top 47, that 46 point differential, there was not enough spots for Chris to gain. So Chris getting eliminated there, uh, I don't think I don't know if Chris knew that or not, but I knew, and uh, that's the way we kind of phrased it that he had done all he could, but he was officially out of the AOI race. And now we said all all eyes are on Brandon Polinick, who came into the first two days of competition and had a 35th and a 37th or something like that overall. So, and that's right there at the magic number. If if Brandon Polinick gets top 38, he wins Angler of the Year. If he doesn't get top 38, Lester needs to make a top 10 and. And the closer that Polinick is to 38th, you know, and 40th, 41st, whatever, the higher Lester has to get. Well, boy, Brandon's Brandon better be lucky and happy that he got 25th in the event and moved up on that day three with a, a great morning. Because if he finished 40th, 41st, 42nd in that tournament and gave himself some wiggle room, Brandon Lester took all that wiggle room away and got fourth place in the event. But I will say, and I've always said this, Fishing is a, a very reactive sport. If Brandon Polinick did not lock up Angler of the Year on day three, Lester may have fished differently on day four and may not have ended up doing what he did. But knowing that he could not win Angler of the Year, they just gave the trophy to Brandon. They can't take it from him anymore and give it to Lester. Lester's just fishing out there to make more money and to do well. And so he ends up busting the biggest bag of the tournament on the final day. Um, so... What a great event, but yeah, Lester, I think, uh, came into his own. We're going to talk about that. We'll do a little bit of a little definition, uh, fishing speak in the next couple minutes about it, but, um, Mississippi river, what a great place to end the season. And we said it from the beginning of the year, the weights are going to be so tight that you could just, you could catch 11 and a half, 12 pounds and drop down the leaderboard. And uh, that's exactly what we saw the first few days of competition. And so separating yourself that week was huge. And, no better way to separate yourself than what Brian Schmidt did catching 17, 10 on day one. You have to, if you're going to be consistent, that's great, but you have to have that bust out day at one of those days to be able to have that shot to separate yourself. And he did that with 17, 10, he did that with 16, 11, and then he had two middle middle bags. Um, so kudos to Brian Schmidt, two for two in tournaments on the Mississippi river out of lacrosse. He won an FLW tour event there in, in a May May time period a couple of years ago, and now has won the Elite Series event in August. Uh, needless to say, Kyle, Brian Schmidt, if there's a river that has grass on it, ah, it's, it's going to be freaking hard to beat him. It's nearly automatic. I mean, that's the thing that's incredible, really, is like, okay, like there's definitely people and anglers that like you get them on a certain body of water, like a Lee Livesey on Fork or um, the Johnston Brothers on the, you know, the the St. Lawrence River that have a massive advantage, but it's Kyle like, Jesse it's just, on Lake Hamilton. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, biggest stick out there probably, but um, I mean, like in in this example, like he's just so good at that style of fishery, and it doesn't have. To, I mean, it can be the Potomac, it can be the Chesapeake, it can be the you know the Pickwicks and the Tennessee River lakes of the world. That James have River. I mean, James River. I mean, obviously Mississippi River. It's incredible how good he is at those types of fishery. Like I. I I thought that he would be a contender coming into the tournament. I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. it's not like he was on my radar, like 
you know, as high as high could be because he wasn't on my fantasy team. But, um, I mean, it's crazy that, like, if you get to a tournament that has those characteristics of grass, current, you know, submerged grass, anything of that nature, like Brian Schmidt is not only going to factor to be, you know, top 10, but like factor to win, it seems like more often than not. Yeah, that's what's crazy is I, I thought about this and let's segue into the next topic. So uh, we talked about at the beginning of the show that we were going to do um, a little bit of Mississippi River talk. We talked about Lake Oahe and and last week in the last podcast a little bit. We're going to end up doing future podcasts with Austin Felix and with Brian Schmidt to talk about their victories in those events. And we'll let them have a few weeks and we'll kind of get through a couple other events to do so. But watching Brandon Lester fish and watching Brian Schmidt fish, it made me think, what is your definition of an underrated angler? I posed this question to the fishing fans on Twitter. Let me pull it up so I can read it word for word. But on Twitter, I said the other day, I said, um, I have a major question for fishing fans. When does a fisherman go from underrated to perfectly rated to overrated? I see it from 30 different angles and I'm still not quite sure other than saying that it's a gut thing. There's everyone has an opinion on it and I could name off a list of anglers right now and say overrated, perfectly rated, underrated, which one Kyle? And you could give a reason why, because the perspective you have looking at them, same person can have the same stats and thoughts and look at it from a different perspective. So it's interesting that some anglers might be overrated in the public's mind. Some, some might never get talked about and they're underrated. So I thought about Lester and Schmidt though, because the definition of underrated and overrated uh, is very, very smudged. And I texted another pro angler and said, at what point can we put Brian Schmidt in the top five or top 10 of winners of all time? Like that's a big statement. I mean, you want to think about the Roland Martins and the Kevin Van Dams and the Rick Cluns and the guys who have just won a bunch of events, the Brandon Polinix and uh, types of events. I'm pretty sure Brian Schmidt's won like nine Toyota Series events and open, like Toyota slash opens, like 10 of those victories, like semi-pro victories. And then he's won a few tour level events. He's now won two Elite Series events. And it's one of those things, like you said, when we think that it's a Brian Schmidt event, he doesn't just show up. He wins those events. He's got to have 15 to 20 semi-pro to pro-level victories. He is low-key the quietest rich guy out there probably because he's made so much money from bass fishing. So, And, and then I go to Brandon Lester who hadn't won anything, but his record in the opens is absolutely astounding. It's like not only does he make a check in 75% of the opens, which is the top 40 out of 220 20 boats not only does lester make a you know a, a top 40 75 of the time but it's like 50 percent of the time he makes a top 10 and it's absolutely incredible his record on the opens uh, and then obviously with the elite series he's been such a consistent guy and this year is the culminating year for brandon lester he wins an open wins an elite gets second in angler of the year and pushes one of the most strong anglers the two two of the most strong anglers with the great reputations and he's wedged right between them. So at a what point does Brandon Lester and Brian Schmidt go from underrated to perfectly rated? Because both guys are really quiet. They're not going to make a big stir. They're not going to be fan favorites when it comes to like shortlist guys. Like who's a shortlist of the best anglers on the elite series. They're going to be like, wait, we were talking about this list. And we forgot to mention these guys. It's going to be an afterthought, but it's not a disrespectful thing. It's because they don't brag about it. So Long story short, I think two of those those two guys are probably getting closer to perfectly rated, but with what they've achieved, I think they're still so mega underrated at, at their true ability on the water. And so I want to get your thoughts on that. Obviously, it's hard to call someone overrated because it sounds like we're being mean, but there's just a perception thing. And for those guys, how little they're talked about versus how much they produce daily on a base on a daily basis those are the two most underrated anglers I've ever seen for ability. Yeah. And I think that the one thing you kind of hit on there, and it's the one thing I keep thinking about when you're, you're having these thoughts is you have to consider like, how do you qualify, you know, if somebody's underrated rated, you know, perfectly or overrated. The thing that always strikes me is like when you get an over or not an overrated guy, an underrated guy, most of those guys to me are the ones that are, super consistent 
they make the classic every year but like you mentioned your persona in bass fishing has so much to do with um you know how people view you which is which is crazy and I, i'm not saying that's a bad thing but like you compare it to let's say baseball you know i'm a big baseball guy there could be a a you know i don't know let's say like a a, a shohei otani obviously doesn't even speak english very well like you know is beloved by fans just purely based on his ability on what he can do on the field right he's obviously an incredible pitcher has you know hitting statistics that are unreal um it's just a freak of nature when it comes to playing baseball but his you know him getting popular wasn't based on like fan interaction things of that nature it's just how good he is at the sport as we're bass fishing once again i'm not saying this is a bad way Bass fishing is like your perception to most a lot of times is not even like how well you do in the tournaments. And a lot of times it is. I'm not look saying at me, look what right. I'm doing. Yeah. I'm not saying that it has no, you know, that it has no place in, in, uh, you know, being a fan favorite or how your perception is just to fans in general. You it obviously win, does. Or you have personality. It's one of the two to get sure, to, get to right. that short list number. Yeah. So like, I mean, you look at, for me, that's kind of where I, I look at it. It's like the guys that are super consistent, like a Brandon Lester, but like you said, he's obviously, you know, quiet, but he's, you know, he's, he's done it as well as anybody over the last few years. It's like, I think you're getting to the point with him where you're thinking like he's getting his due credit, what he deserves. But at the same point, like, like he's been un underrated. I think we'd both agree for a long time because he has been doing this at this level for such a long time. And to only have missed, I think he said the other day on stage one classic in his entire time, the elites. I mean, um, I think consistency is where a lot of people will look at a guy and they'll, you know, he'll be underrated to them because, you know, you look at like, you could sit here and list guys for days, but like Luke Palmer is another one. You know, if you look at Luke Palmer, how well he's done over the, you know, in his entire time of the elites, people overlook him because he hasn't won any events. Um, you know, he's not the guy that's going to get up on stage and hoop and holler, or do anything crazy. He is very funny, but like, you know, he's dude's made the classic every year that he's fished and as an elite and has been, you know, killing it rock but solid. He's underrated because you don't think of him as like the winner. So when you think uh, about it. Like, let me bizarre. just, let me list off a couple of guys that fit that same recipe that Brandon Lester and Brian Schmidt do. I'll just say Brandon Lester, Brian Schmidt, Mark Frazier, Micah Frazier, Shane LeHue, Brandon Cobb, Luke Palmer, Brock Mosley, Caleb Kufal. Why don't we just, <laughs> we can name off so many guys who are just, quiet reserve to themselves get the job done and they're almost the ones that you want to count on and so i think somebody mentioned it and they said i think the true underrated overrated and perfectly rated is the only way you can look at it is fantasy fishing and for no reason whatsoever there will be anglers that are at 42 percent and you're like why the heck are they at 42 percent meanwhile a brian schmidt's at 11 percent or something and you're like he's got to be the favorite or i'm going to take this guy's value because Brandon Polinex, 46%. Not, I will say, there are times in your career you can be overrated and you don't perform. Like Brandon Polinex at Lake Oahe this year, I'll say it to his face, he was overrated. Put it 50% in bucket A and you got Taku, Corey Johnson, and Chris Johnston all at 10% or less. Two of those three I just mentioned made the top 10. Top in 10. that situation, Brandon Polinex was overrated and they were underrated. So there was a great point that someone said in fantasy that you can really tell that based on percentages is sure. it's not demeaning their character that they're, they don't have the skills to be perfectly rated. It's that the value system that some fans or media have put on players. I think Mike Trout's a great example as well. If you want to go baseball, he's one of the biggest superstars in the sport that doesn't tweet he doesn't talk to nobody. He doesn't do nothing. Meanwhile, like a Bryce Harper might get a lot more love because he's going to be antics or he's still a good player, but those things he gets talked about a little bit more. And so uh, like Tim Duncan in the NBA doesn't sure. get talked about unless it's just because of how dang good he is. So you either got to win or you got to get talked about for other reasons. And so we've said that I said to be a successful elite series pro, some guys make a living uh, talking about fishing some guys make or some guys make a living with sponsorships around fishing. Some guys make a living because they catch them. And some guys become superstars because they have sponsorships and they catch them. They do both of them. So until you get your footing, you got to do one or the other. But uh, I think that's just something that I was, it's like a, it's like a brain quiz or like a brain buster. It makes me think about that. Like who would fall into that category? Um, and honestly, maybe am I underrated? Am I overrated? is Kyle Jesse perfectly rated? Like, what are we, oh, you know, we could do that for anything, but <laughs> that's yeah, beside the point. 
fishing too bass fishing is is bizarre in the sense that like think about how easy it is to overlook somebody that finished ninth in aoi i mean like that's the, i mean i don't even know who finished ninth in aoi let's do this hey, let's let's like, do this you let's can do literally this. have you can have an incredibly good season and almost get not noticed at all which is just just a strange concept really but let's try to let's try to do this don't cheat on your computer and this is just off the top of my head uh and i've looked at it but because we focus so much at the top and then the the cut line for the classic and things let's try to list the top 10 anglers that are in angler of the year not in order but let's just try to list the 10 anglers we can just get them close i'm going to go in order and then uh we try to fill in the gaps but i'm going to go top top four i know for sure brandon polinick brandon lester chris johnston drew ben uh do you know who got fifth off the top of my head? Yeah, off the top of your I, head. I, I haven't even looked at the AOI standings since the end of the tournament, I don't think, to be completely honest with you. Um, um, I want to think. I want to uh, say Matt Airy somewhere in the top 10. Matt Airy might be a good out. one. My, Matt Airy might be a good one for the top the top five right there. Um, really, we're just showing people how much we don't know. No, no. I mean, I can, <laughs> I can tell you, John. I can tell you John Cox is in the top 10. Sure. I can tell you that uh, – well, I'm I'm now blank. Let me look at the angler list, not this AOI standings. Let me look at the angler list and just just get all of the people in my head uh, who are thinking about oh elite field. Yeah, let me just do this real quick. We've got um. Let me look, scroll through the names real quick and see if I can name them off. Um, I want to say obviously there at the end, Benton was coming on strong. Yeah, it was, I said I he, he got four. Oh, you said Benton. Yeah, you said Benton. yeah, he got four. I knew the top four for sure. The other six, though, John Cox is in there somewhere. Matt Aries in there Walters, somewhere. Walters, Walters is yeah. Walters is in the top ten. So there's three of the six that we need to name. Um, is Stetson Blaylock in the top ten? Uh, he might be in tenth or something like that. Um, Jay Shakira, I think, is tenth. Gerald Swindle had a shot to pass him, I do believe. Gerald got Zaldane, 11th. Zaldane, I think. Zaldane well, I was in before there. Before that event, he was hovering around the top yep. 10. So I would imagine stayed in the top 10. I would say that's the case for sure. Um, Matt Robertson, I think, maybe. So now let's go to the AOI standings. Let's do it. This was just something off the top of my head that, hey, I'm not embarrassed by it because we have a lot of numbers. Okay. Brandon yeah. Polinick, Brandon Lester, Chris Johnston, Drew Ben. We got those right. Patrick Walters was fifth. Matt Airy was sixth, Matt Robertson was seventh, John Cox was eighth, Chris Aldean was ninth, and Jay Shakir was tenth. See, all I needed to do was just look at the elite roster and scroll it, and I know it, but it's, like you said, that bottom four or five in the top ten, you were one of the top ten anglers, and it's so hard unless you've sure. won an event to remember that. And so uh, that just goes to show that whole overrated, underrated, perfectly rated thing. There are a lot of good anglers and uh, it's just when you go on a hot streak, we've seen Christy get on a hot streak. We've seen Cherry get on a hot streak. Livesey, we've seen all these different guys get on hot streaks. Fighter, um, Fighter still has one of the best seasons of all time. Polonix 66th at, sixth at Oahe took him out of conversation for that. So there it is. The Also, Kyle, I'm going to segue us. The main reason we shot this podcast today is because on Wednesday, September 31st, we came out two days after the season ended with the 2023 Bassmaster Elite Series schedule. Let me read it off to you guys um, on what the tournament schedule for 2023 is going to look like for the elites, and I'll, I'll incorporate the dates as well. But for the Bassmaster Elite Series next year, kicking off the season mid-February, Lake Okeechobee, February 16th through the 19th. Then you have Lake Seminole, February 23rd through the 26th. I didn't even know there was 26 days in February. I we got to be toting the line on that one, Kyle. You got to keep me straight on the calendar there. Then we go through the Classic in March. And then we've got Lake Murray out of South Carolina and Santee Cooper. Those are back-to-back -back events, and that's April 20th through the 23rd, April 27th through the 30th, back-to-back -back there. So we have a back-to-back Florida-Georgia line there, and then we have a back-to-back -back in South Carolina. In May, the second week of May, May 11th through the 14th, we have Lay Lake. And then we have June 1st through the 4th, Sabine River. July 27th through the 30th, Lake St. Clair. August 17th through the 20th, Lake Champlain. And August 24th through the 27th, St. Lawrence River. A couple quick takeaways by, by each of us. Kyle, what stands out to you on here? Um, and we can go through the schedule and pick out places we're excited to see, places that we expected to see, and 
some thoughts on uh, time of year as well. But your first, when you saw the nine events on the schedule, what was your first takeaway from it? Well, I mean, being completely transparent here, I think that I'm like most in the sense that I want, you know, variety or difference, you know, things, events that are different, places we haven't been in a while. It doesn't have to be places we've never been because there's so many lakes with, you know, Bass has been to, you know, nearly all of them to the point that's hard to suggest going somewhere that we've never been because it's, there's almost just not a list of those places. If they have not came, if the Elite Series has not came to your local lake, you can tweet at Kyle Jesse and tell him which lake they have not been to because yeah, he just said all of them. Do. So just tweet please it. Do. That's not my actual Twitter handle. So please oh, it's, do. Oh, sorry. It's <laughs> KA Jesse 8, I believe. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll see. Um, so, I mean, that was my first uh, impression was just the fact that I love that we're going to a lot of places that we haven't been to in a while. I mean, right off the top, Obviously, Okeechobee and Seminole, it's been years and years since both of those, um, you know, we've been to either of those places. Murray is a place my brother just moved to. He lives in Columbia, South Carolina. I've got to fish it a few times. I think in the last few years, you've seen Murray take a giant step forward, obviously, where, you know, largemouth and spots are both players, but like largemouth for a herring lake. And this is something you and I talked about on the phone, I think, yesterday. But, you know, Murray, I think, is another one. Um, the one thing I'm super happy about is obviously Lay Lake. I'd say that's, that's a given, given how close it is to Birmingham. And it's the lake that since I've moved here to Birmingham that I've fished the most. So I'm really curious to see how that's uh, going to end up playing out. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, you know, to, to get all this, of course. But, um, but, yeah, I would say the first thing that stood out was Lay Lake. I was definitely excited about that. So, we say I classified it when I tweeted it that we have four new venues that we haven't been to normally, like you said, we've been to places. And so if you haven't been there in the last three or four seasons, I'm going to say, welcome back. Uh, 2017 for Lake Okeechobee, 2014 for Lake Seminole, 2011 for Lake Murray. And we've never had lay Lake for the elite series. And if you want to count the classics, it's 2010 was the last time we were there. So for all four of those places, it's been more than five years and some of it going back as far as a decade to 12 years that we haven't been there. So four new places out of those places, which one are you most excited to see play out? And given the reasons why, whether you've never seen a tournament there, you've never been there yourself, or you just expected to show out a lot more than people think. Um. You're going to have to list those four again. I was reading. And Okeechobee, well. Seminole, Murray, and uh, the four you listed, Lay Lake, Murray, Okeechobee, okay. and Seminole. Which um, one do you think that other than, you know, just I know you mentioned each of them and why, but like out of those four ones, that the fans are going to really love all of them, but why? I, I think that – and you want me to pick one that I'm, yeah. I think – Yeah, yeah that's fine. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Seminole, to be honest. I think that – that's been one that, you know, you've heard rumblings about like maybe going back there, this, that, and the other. I think that Seminole offers a lot, um, you know, for those guys, as far as, um, you know, the grass and things like that. And, and the way that guys can fish that event. Um, and when you look at February events, I mean, you're so, we're, we're so accustomed now to seeing those Florida style tournaments, which obviously it's right there on the border. I'm not suggesting it's like a hundred miles away from Florida, but something just a tad bit different. I mean, I think that, Seminole at that time of the year, it seems like from everything I've ever heard, and I don't know the current state of the lake right this second because I'm, you know, don't pay attention to Seminole Lake local bass tournaments or anything, but it seems like that time of the year in history has proved that, you know, big weights can come out of there. And I think that at that time of the year, end of February, I mean, I think that we're going to see some giant bass get caught. I think that for a lot of the anglers, and, you know, some you've mentioned, obviously you know, a giant part of the field has probably never fished Seminole. So it's going to be new for them. And I think that it has a real potential to be a slugfest. And uh, early in the season, I think that's what we're all looking forward to. We'll all be bundled up cold in February and we'll go to somewhere that's a little bit warmer and uh, hopefully see these guys get some big ones. Yeah, I like Seminole as well. And one reason why is because when it is actually cold, it's one of those places that it's if you get a cold front in actually the state of Florida, you know, St. John's river and South, if you get a cold front, it's everyone's morale goes down because the fishing is not going to be nearly as good. But like you said, if, if it goes, goes down and gets cold, you got a bladed jig bite, 
you've got a lipless bite, you've got a jerk bait bite, you've got deep water, you've got shallow water, you got a lot of different things. The spawn will be in all different phases, but for those first four events, it, they will be spawn oriented. You know, I'm also excited about Lake Murray because it's from the, you know, I'm from the Carolinas. And so fishing Lake Murray, um, I've done that a few times and it's a special place as well. We would see a totally different lake one month later, you know, mid to late May, we'd see a totally different lake, but to be able to see power fish in largemouth on a place that looks like Lake Hartwell, you know what I'm saying? Like it's a blueback herring, but it's not a spotted bass dominated fishery. And so sure. you're going to have to be able to, you can, you're going to see people throwing a buzz bait. You're going to see people flipping. You're going to see people swimming a jig. You're going to see people doing all of those different things, wake baits, whatever the case may be. Um, and there'll still be some, maybe, maybe there's a, a group of fish that either spawned early or hasn't quite moved up yet. And they're going to be on some of those brush on the brush piles and the cane and sure. different things. It'll be sure. interesting to see how, how that tournament plays out. I guarantee you, you'll see people run all the way up the Saluda River. You'll see people fish down by the dam and all the islands around there. You'll see, I mean, when you look at the lake cutout, there are so many little creek arms that you can go back and get in that it's a place that you can, that can fish bigger than it looks. You know, it can, it can have a lot of boats on that body of water. And we'll probably see that Labor Day, you know, in just a couple of days <laughs> on Lake Murray is probably packed. But um, really excited about those couple of new ones that we haven't been to in a little while. And then also to end the year with the St. Lawrence River, if we tried to duplicate it and do it in July again and break 100 pounds, that's the only thing you're going to compare it to. But if we could break 100 pounds at the St. Lawrence River in August as well, which is much more likely than July was, that'll be very interesting. Um, so out of Clayton, New York for the St. Lawrence River, that'd be good. Uh, Lake Champlain, like I mentioned, and then also Lake St. Clair. Those are our three northern events to end the year. Um, but yeah, that's the schedule for 2023. And when you think about it, you want to mix in a couple new events. I think four is quite a bit. Um, I, I love having the Sabine on there as a grinder, even lay Lake. If there's are two grinders in the middle of the season, I think if I got on my little soapbox, I would be mad at fishing fans because we all fish grinders but you don't want to watch grinders. They always talk about, they don't want to watch these boring events. They don't want to watch these different things. I think they're some of the most dynamic events as someone who literally no offense watches every single second of every single event. I have to talk about it. I think the Sabine is dynamic on the strategy on where you go. And I think in the month of June, everyone online was saying they're going to melt to death. We had a Sabine River event in the month of June. Greg Hackney won it, and it fished bigger than it had ever fished when, with only the Texas waters in play. Because in June, you're not worried about cold fronts, not worried about the spawn. They're not all in one back-end canal that everyone's trying to fish in. A lot more water becomes fishable. Um, and so I like that fact of it. And then like we talked about with Lay Lake, you'll have the current guys up in the, the tail race. You'll have the people fishing for spotted bass. You'll have the people fishing at the dam on the opposite end for largemouth and, and treating it like a lake and not a, not a Coosa River. You'll have a lot of different things to play. Yeah, the weights won't be as big, but man, when you see a big bag or when you see a five pounder, it means more on those bodies of water. When you see Greg Hyden catch a five at, Saint, at Sabine, you know, that just changed the day that just chance a game changer, you know? And so same thing can go for lay Lake. So that's my little soapbox rant. We getting too spoiled with these hundred pound bags. I love it, but I love to see these 55 to 70 pound weights too. So let's see some Damn. of those mixed in and we'll, we'll see a true um, display of, of, of those tournaments. So that's my thoughts. No, I agree hundred percent. I think that having a couple of those post spawn grinder type tournaments, and I'm not saying that, Lay Lake could be really good. That time of the year, I think that you could see a really good morning bite. I think that, you know, the chat spawn could obviously be a huge factor there. I think that you're going to have fireworks because it's very much like the um, Mississippi River in the sense that it's a visually appealing tournament. If it all goes, you know, the way that people want it to, you'll have guys catch them on a swim jig, on a frog, buzz bait, top waters, running up the river, fishing current. Like you said, there'll definitely be some fish off the bank at that point. You can fish the lower end of the lake. Um, and that's just from my experience and I'm no expert out there. I wish I caught them better out because it's not easy, but I mean, you're like going to you catch them good after this tournament though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be my own boat driver, marking waypoints on everybody's stuff. You'll but, be the uh, guy that you complain about when you're yeah, like, you know, yeah. on the road. 100%. So <laughs> 100%. But, um, and then I'm, I'm like you, the Sabine river tournaments, I've always really thoroughly enjoyed 
Um, and it was actually ironic. I, I shot some stuff with Greg Hackney the other day at uh, Mississippi River for practice got started. And, you know, he was he was talking about how he wishes there was more summertime grinder southern tournaments. Because like anymore, there's just almost none of those to be fished. Long, because we, yeah. we just go north and, you know, we go fish all these other fisheries, which is fine. I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. But, you know, rarely ever do we have any of those tournaments where you just got to grind it out with it. You know, his example was like grind out with a square bill, flipping, pitching, like, you know, like grinder river style tournaments. And naturally, like that plays into his hands going back there to the Sabine. But like you said, the storylines that, that come from that tournament every year, to me are, are worth the the lower weights 100 percent because of how big of a change you can make i remember last year or two years ago rather when we were at the sabine i remember watching thinking that everybody had almost just given up on the day and thinking that you know christy had it it was done but mostly was literally one good frogfish away there at late of the day from not just that he taking lost the lead. he did lose right it, yeah. not just taking the lead but like i mean like just zooming past him which to me just makes it such an interesting storyline. And, and like you said, making the long runs, we saw what Christy did when he was there, you know, a couple of years ago, running to basically Houston. I mean, there are so many storylines that play out at that tournament that I think that the majority of people don't really appreciate, but I think that, you know, like you said, people like you and I that have to see every second of it, like it's, it's a lot that goes on. I mean, there's just because you're not, you know, catching 25 pound bags a day. I mean, doesn't mean that the interest, you know, the tournament's not interesting. And I think that's where, uh, where you and I agree on that without a question. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited for those couple of events and, and really, to be honest, I'm just excited about the entire schedule. I think you and I both look forward to the schedule coming out every single year. I think that that's one of the most exciting days of the entire year outside of maybe like the last day of the classic, like to me, that's one of my favorite days of the year is seeing where these guys are going to go um and to see some new places some places that people didn't expect i think you know for me is is a is a huge victory for for everybody because i think the fans love it i think the majority of the anglers love it i think that it was a uh, great job you know from the bass staff obviously getting that uh, put together and i'm not being biased i really do think that that was the schedule's great yeah and you can see it so over the past few years they've they've basically not been limited but with covid and with all the restrictions and with communities being hit economy wise not having the budgets maybe they spend their budget on other things maybe they're not allowed to have big events you know we take for granted that we had elite series events in new york only Na like nascar and bassmaster were allowed to do professional sporting events in new york without super crazy regulations and sure. uh, obviously, rightfully so, but like basketball, football, everybody had to go through hoops to get there and do it. So did Bassmaster and so did NASCAR, but we got it done. And we just take for granted on some of these communities that they're, for one, I don't know how many communities Eric Lopez is calling. He might be calling 100 communities for nine events. Um, there are some communities who have to go through the process. They have to host a high school college event first or an open first. You got to host that first. We got to see how you do. It's if you're a new place and then boom, we can maybe get you in the elites for a, a deal. I, I'm pretty sure when Bay was that way, when Bay, we had, uh, I think we had a college event and then we had an elite series event there, you know? And so it was one of those things that we needed to, they test, or I think we had a nation event. We had a nation event at Winya, Then we had an elite event and then we had college and then we've had an elite event since. So it's like, you got to mix in and try things. And so I think there are some destinations that maybe they only call bass when they want to host a classic. Maybe they only call bass when they want to have co-anglers and voters show up. So it's more people, maybe strategically, you don't need them to show up in March and April and May. Maybe your tough tourism time is July and September and you try to get them in. So I will say uh, there's a lot of things that go into the schedule and honestly, people are like, man, if you came to the Sabine in April, the weights would be much better, maybe by six or seven pounds total, but I'm not going to trade a Santee Cooper in April for a Sabine in April and do Santee in July or June. You're just not going to do that. It makes more sense to go to the places sometimes in the heat of the spawn when you can bust a hundred pounds or when it's the big fish are going to show up. And when it's indifferent on river systems, they kind of fluctuate with the time and the tides and the, the time of year. There are still high points. We got to make do with what you got to make do. But I always remember when fishing fans say they don't like grinders, one of the, if not the most famous and 
memorable classic that people loved was the 2005 Three Rivers Classic that took 12 pounds for three days to win. When someone had four pounds, seven ounces for a five fish limit, they were shooting fireworks off on the stage because it was a big bag for the day. So I will say 12 pounds for three days is not what we're shooting for, but man, that was a fun tournament and a memorable one. And so we think about that in perspective. It's okay to have a grinder. I remember the Winyah Bay 2019 event when we had two other professional levels, one of them at Cherokee Lake, one of them at Chickamauga. And I had people texting me that they loved the Winyah Bay event because of the strategy that was involved. You had Stetson staying close, Scott Canterbury went far, who was going to win, all of those different factors, the gas, so many different things that anglers have to take into account. So all the complaining, it's fine. I'm the bass mascot, according to people, whatever. I mean, I love what I do for a living, so of course I care about it. But I also see both sides of the spectrum, and so I love our schedule for this year. I think I told you in the off season I would love to see Lake Murray on there. We hadn't been to Lake Murray in so long, and poof, they were tapping my phone, and uh, they knew that I said that, and then they got it and they made it happen. So kudos to Eric Lopez. Maybe if Davey Hyde had something to do with it, awesome. But Kyle, I'll ask you this question. What's a place that we've either been to before but haven't been there in a long time or a place we've never been to that you might want to see an Elite Series event that could realistically hold 100 boats and a, a way in stage, you know, at a, at a takeoff location? I mean, Lake Washita. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, for me, that's that's definitely where I want to go. Where would you want them to take um, off out of? Um, I would say Crystal Springs. Crystal Springs. Uh, you could do there or uh, Brady Mountain. Um, obviously I think yeah. both of the, I not, not, I think both those ramps are big enough to house a hundred boats easily. I mean, they have a uh, different variety of level tournaments there that have well over a hundred boats. I've fished in yeah. a lot yeah. of yeah. tournaments. BFLs yeah, I mean, have a hundred. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Mr. Bass. I mean, there's a lot of things in Arkansas. Um, you know, and, and this is also coming from a place of, you know, being a little biased, but I think that you could have that tournament different times of the year and it would be really interesting. I think you could have a pre-spawn. Um, early in the year i mean you know see guys catch them on jerk baits you know deep uh run up the river catch them shallow i think there's a lot of storylines that could happen there i think you know like you just said it's easy to be a southern fishery and be like oh if you just went there in the spring it'd be really good like yeah. of course it would like everywhere is good in the spring and we're the gonna south. do like, seven good. events from the middle of march to right. the end of april we're just right. going and knocking out the whole no season. i mean we're gonna have the tournaments are gonna overlap each other so much that they're gonna be monday through thursdays and like just random days but no i mean i, I really do think that and i think that um it hasn't been uh I guess targeted on the professional level and in a few years at, at really any at any level um you know I, i'm beaver from lake. sure i mean i think beaver lake's the same way I, I i'm super partial to arkansas in general so i think that the the tournaments that used to be in bull shoals were super awesome i mean from bp winning to, i mean there, there was there were so many different things there and it was the same way as the mississippi river in the sense that you caught a lot of fish Christy i mean there's just a and lot Farfin, of fish yeah i mean there's just there's a lot of different, all those tournaments are interesting and they all have interesting like ties to them. I mean, Christy pulling up the last, you know, last day and just, you know, sacking them up on a top water, like where it's still springtime and they're just schooling like out in the middle of the lake. I mean, there are so many things that are interesting about those white river lakes. When you talk about beaver, um, I would even throw Tabor rock in the same mix. I mean, any of those three uh, white river lakes, I think all are super interesting. Um, obviously, we always go and we always see table rock in like, the fall or it's always like in the opens at the end of the year or other times and other schedules it's always towards the end of the year you could do what we did my first year on the elites 2014 they had table rock and i think it was late march or something like that because the classic was still in february it was it's late march it good. was so cold <laughs> yet it was um it was such a dynamic event with jerk baits and, and all those different things sure. playing and you could run to the james you could stay down at the lower end whatever so there's a lot of different things to play it, but I'll give you one. Smith Mountain Lake. I would love to see us go back to Smith Mountain Lake. Maybe, maybe you do it. Um, you could do that one in the fall to end the season. Let's just say we go do a northern swing and then we come down for one more, you know, at the end. If you want to have something encroach into the fall, that's still Virginia. It's not super hot, super crazy, but it's going to be warmer than up north north and then uh you could also do it in march and april like we saw the other elites before and i think that man depending on if the, if the classic is late march you could do something on smith mountain probably the first week of march and have a couple week gap or the last week of february and it would be cold but it'd be just like a cherokee lake event you know or, or something like that where you have like a cold highland reservoir 
and uh, and you and you knock out a tournament. So I think uh, I think now that we're at least six feet past COVID, you know, like we can start to really mix in those new places. Uh, you can go to those new you can go to those new venues, those new tourism places, and talk to them. Shoot, I had people. I'll talk about this with you for just a few minutes before we before we knock out the podcast and, and wrap it up. But had people messaging me, when y'all gonna come out west? And I'm like, we had all the intentions of coming out west 2019, but with everything that happened in 2018, a lot of the anglers didn't want to. That's one of the reasons that they said they were leaving. They didn't want to spend the money to go there. Right now, the economy, the gas prices, the regulations, it's hard. The lack of water in a lot of those lakes out west, hard to do those bodies of water. But I went ahead and told him, I said, it's easier said than done. If you want us to come out west, get me the phone number and an email address of one of those Chamber of Commerce people for that lake in that region, and I will send it to the folks. I, but my ideal thing, and, and if, do you agree with me on this? If we went out west with bass, if we did a bass event, an elite series event out west, it would have to be three events in a four week stretch. Like we gotta go, we gotta go over there and do it. Like we can't just go there for two events where anglers are fishing four days, possibly, you know, day one, day two, they get cut. Next week, day one, day two, they get cut. They just went to California for four days of fishing. Um with all the expenses, do you agree that we need to do like three events in four weeks to where we're, it's a, it's a third of our season was a Western swing. A third was North and a third was South or something, you know? Yeah. I think that makes sense. Um, there's so many logistical questions when it comes to that. Obviously I don't want to get into it and speculate because it's really not my place to say, but I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. And I think that makes perfect sense. It's hard to justify doing that. Like you said, you definitely can't do it one week, like one event. I mean, it's just not even remotely worth it. Two events, you know, like you said, there's definitely a, a major possibility for it not working out. But then, I mean, when you're talking about doing three events, the thing you have to keep in mind, too, is that a third of the Elite Series schedule is in one state. Well, it doesn't have to be one state, but more or less one little small part of the country, Um which, you know, I guess your, your comeback to that for most people out there would be like, well, we have three events in four weeks in, you know, the Southeast or whatever, but I mean, it's a lot to consider. I mean, it's, it's one thing I, I am not very outspoken on because I don't have a strong preference either way. Um, I, I would love to see some of those fisheries, you know, the elite series go back to some of those fisheries because those have been some of my favorite tournaments to watch from a, a TV standpoint, but um, you know, like you said, there's a lot of logistics that go into making that work. And, uh, like you said, I mean, what, what would be your ideal three lakes you would want to go to if you had three tournaments and four weeks out West? I mean, you've got a couple different options. Probably you've got, um, depending on service. I mean, when I was there in 2015, it was terrible. And with the less and less water, the lower, the more, the more you get in the Valley, you know what I'm saying? But mead is always thrown out there by people. They love mead, but like, the fact that you could do a Havasu and a Mead, and then you could do, um, you know, I think even Falcon and Amistad are over there enough that you could do a Falcon and Amistad and a, and a, you know, a Havasu and a Mead or something around there in the middle of the season. I think you could start it. It could be like a, a four week break after the classic. And then we have, you know, half your field has at least made some money this year from the classic and they can go out West. But um, people were asking about Mojave. They're asking about the Cal Delta, Clear Lake. There's so many different places. And a lot of those are central to Northern California. Um, we obviously had a thoughts of going to the Columbia River up in Washington, you know, in 2019, that was a possibility, but it is very difficult. I explained to someone, I said, it is 20 hours for me to get, to Lake Havasu from Little Rock. It is 18 hours to get from Orlando to, Clay to Clayton. From Orlando to Clayton, it's 18 hours. From Little Rock to Havasu, it's 20. And I'm in the middle of the country to go do that. So the East Coast guys would have to do a whole lot of travel there. So yeah, we'd have to figure out a way to make it happen. Um, and honestly, we'd have to guarantee full fields of marshals. 
and we'd want to make it big. But I do think I will say the one thing that makes those events out West memorable is that we don't see them all the time. And so we remember the ones we do see. If we went out there every single year and then we occasionally went to Lake Okeechobee, people, the viewers would get so accustomed to seeing that type of fishing, the big swim baits, the drop shots, things like that out there. They'd be like, oh my God, did you see the grass mats at Lake Okeechobee or whatever, the reeds? Uh, the Thule's as they call them, you know, so it's a different thing, but I do know it's because we haven't seen it lately that a lot of people want it, but there is so much, so many logistics. It's not like there's a, other tournament trails just always going out there. So it's, it's a hard thing to do. I would love to see it at some point. Um, and, and we may see it, you know, in future years, hopefully. Do you, do you want to take a stab at how long it is from Lake Mead to Falcon Lake? <laughs> I bet you it's probably 12 hours. 20 hours and 26 minutes is it really that far oh my <laughs> gosh i was wondering and i wasn't what you were even looking at. i wasn't even looking that up to try to prove you wrong or anything i was just curious if that was even like possible is it but even over all, there? I know, yeah. all i know is that from south dakota to wisconsin seemed like a really long ways and it was a nine hour drive um you know to get to get from mobridge to uh lacrosse so <laughs> basically double that drive I mean, it would oh, be, I'm yeah. not even, I think, uh, oh shoot, that's correct. Because it's not even, I mean, we think about it being West Texas for Falcon and for, for Amistad, but Amistad's three hours North of that. And they're, they're not even West Texas. That's like South. It's South, South Texas. It's like South yeah. Texas. Yeah. South for Central. Real. I mean, you draw a straight line on the same plant San Antonio is. Yeah. They are much farther. Well, maybe we can go to, um, uh, I don't know. Well, forget, well, forget we even said anything. <laughs> we're gonna go to Ele we're gonna go to Elephant Butt Reservoir, which is on the border of it's in New Mexico and Texas. Yeah, we're gonna go to Elephant Butt right below Albuquerque, and then we'll go over to Phoenix over there by Arizona, and we'll go to, and then we'll go to Las Vegas. Um, but no, there's a lot of good intentions. The logistics definitely. I mean, Lake Powell is a place that's over by Mead as well. Um, why don't we just put them on Great Salt Lake? There's probably no bass in there. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, we get off the topic a little bit, but it is a long drive out there. There's a lot of logistics, but I do know that our guy, Eric Lopez, who helps and controls a lot of the scheduling and talking to people is doing his best to keep it fresh. So um, we appreciate that. 2023 schedule just came out. The open schedule, just a couple weeks away for that. And then college, high school, everyone who keeps asking, just when you see one schedule come out, just assume a couple weeks later, the next one's going to come out. A couple weeks later, the next one's going to come closer. out. closer. Yeah, we're getting much closer. I always like to tell people, if you don't see it by Thanksgiving, give me a call because we need to get it out if it hasn't came out since Thanksgiving. So, Kyle, I think we're going to let you go off that one. I've, uh, I've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm already looking forward to next year's elite season, no question. But uh, I'm also looking forward to seeing – College how, football season, baby, though. Yeah, let's, let's be honest. I'm definitely looking forward to that. By the time people are listening to this, I'll be uh, – I'll be back in the great state of Arkansas, about ready to root on the hogs. So, uh, will you yeah, call the hogs I'll, for me real quick on the podcast? Please? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save them all for this weekend. Uh, but I'm certainly looking forward to that. Obviously, looking forward to some of these opens coming up. That's going to clear up the picture a lot for uh, for certain people. So, definitely a lot to look forward to. But it's easy to look forward to uh, next year's Elite Series schedule for sure. Awesome. Uh, does Arkansas beat Cincinnati this weekend, and by how much? Yes, they do, and I'm going to say they beat them by 17. Okay, good. I said 14, so – and that's with me not even knowing who the starting quarterback is for Cincinnati, so. They don't either, apparently, or they <laughs> do and they're not saying, so we'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> exactly. Well, Kyle, I appreciate you hopping on for another podcast. We will uh, we'll talk next week, do another one, uh, and we will talk to some of our winners. And I'll actually be in the state of Alabama next week shooting some content with, with a couple of our anglers and uh, – I see you. I'll give you a shout. Otherwise, we'll see you on the podcast.